Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. We're going to move to the third letter this week of these seven letters here in the beginning. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas, one of my faithful mar or was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save, saving he that receiveth it. Alright, let's remember what we're doing again, while we're doing this. If I just put a timeline up here starting with Adam, and I run it all the way across to the end. Okay, now put the cross up here. We're looking at what uh, the Apostle John was shown, a series of visions, and that's what the book of Revelation is. And as soon as you say Revelation, we have been trained to think what? You look at CNN and the Middle East and not right. But you better well, that's not what the book is for. The book is written to the churches to show the churches what they can expect between the first coming and the second coming. Now, does it include a lot of judgment and what? Yeah, there's a lot of that. But folks, it's not limited to that. And in the very beginning of the letter, we have these seven different letters sent to the seven churches. And remember, he just picked seven because seven is the number of completion. In other words, these are seven letters to show us what's the experience of the church going to be like. Every church can find themselves at one time or another under these conditions. In other words, uh, walking the wrong way, falling back, be, you know, there's all. And in fact, every believer can find himself passed through these different uh, periods. Now remember the first one we looked at was Ephesus. And that one uh, was kind of characterized by leaving your first love. Now who's the first love? Christ is the love that the church is compared to the bride of Christ, like a marriage. And basically what happens is, to, to get started, let's just do this. Why is the church likened unto Christ's bride? Of all things, why a bride? Because he paid for them. He bought and paid for with his own blood. Yeah. And the picture is not that he went and found him some... Uh, some beautiful, glorious, rich woman with a dowry. That's not the picture at all. The picture is that he found a woman who was enslaved. Remember in the book of Hosea, you've got the picture. The Lord told Hosea to go marry a harlot, didn't he? And he said that he married the harlot and said she's going to be unfaithful to you. And she was. And he put her out of his house. She, got, she fell so low that she became a slave. And there she is on the slave block being auctioned off. Now, y'all can imagine a woman in the Roman Empire being auctioned as a slave. It's going to be more than cleaning house she's going to be. It's going to be real bad, isn't it? And they're, they, they're all making fun of her because her reputation is so bad. She's just, you know, just in... And the men are joking and laughing. Nobody's even going to bid on her. And all of a sudden, from the back row comes a bid of, like we would say today, $10 million. And everybody turns around to see who in the world would pay that for this woman. And it's Hosea, her husband, isn't it? And the picture is that he's redeeming her out of slavery, right? Now, how are we all born into this world? Slaves. We're born slaves. Right. Slave unto sin. We're a slave unto sin. And the reason we're slaves unto sin is because of the choice of Adam. It's just like right now, okay, I'm not Irish, I'm American. Did I choose to be an American? <clears throat> I'm here because of a choice of my grandfather. In other words, he left Ireland and, and chose for me, didn't he? He chose for all his offspring when he made that choice. Well, Adam chose for the entire human race when he rebelled against God. Therefore, when Adam had children, Adam was created in God's image, but when Adam had Cain and Abel, what does the Bible say? They were born in the image of Adam. And what is that? It's a sin nature. And we've all got it. And it persists all the way down through all time. Now just because someone gets saved, does that mean they're not a sinner anymore? Still a sinner. 
You're just a redeemed sinner, aren't you? So this sin is passed along. I'm a sinner because my mom and dad reproduced after their own kind. And what were they? Sinners. sinners. And it just keeps going back. So when you read sin in the Bible, don't think drinking, smoking. People say, well, that's a sin, and that's a sin, and that's a sin. No, those are sins. Sin is a noun, and it's a condition. And we're all born in sin. How many sins makes you a sinner? One. One. If you keep all the law of Moses, what does James 2.10 say? Keep it all, but break one, and what are you guilty, guilty of? of You're guilty of breaking them all. So how could I be more or less guilty than Bobby? Okay. We're the same. How could Bobby be more or less guilty than Maddie? We all are guilty of breaking all the law, aren't we? So someone immediately would say, well, why would God give such a law? Is the law bad? No, the law is good. The law is a good thing, isn't it? Why? Show you. You know, a fellow told me one time he was mad about a diagnosis he got that he, uh, he had cancer. He was mad about the diagnosis. He said, I wish I'd have never went to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, no offense, but that's a dumb thing to say, isn't it? The, that, that found the problem, didn't it? And he was getting treatment, and he's still alive today. I'm sure today he wouldn't say that, but he started getting treatment. Would he have ever known to even address the disease if he didn't have the test? Mm -hmm. But what did God give Moses' law for? A test for all mankind. Paul said, we know that what things soever the law saith. Now let's put the law back here. He said it says it to every man, and in order that he might walk right before God, no. become guilty before God. Now why would God want to declare the whole human race guilty before we were even born? We can't glory in ourselves. We can't glory in ourselves, that's for sure. But let me ask y'all, this is legal, legal talk. The book of Romans is the most perfect legal document. Even judges today will tell you, yeah, it's a perfect legal document. All right? In the book of Romans, what's the first thing Paul does in the first two and a half chapters? He declares all mankind guilty, doesn't he? All of them. Now, why would God want to find everybody guilty? Can you pass sentence before you're guilty? No. You've got to no. be found guilty before sentence is passed, right? If he did that to us, he was going to give us a way out. That's right. So you got it. And because he passed guilt, look, we were all found guilty way back here. See, Jesus Christ died. Today we're over here and Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago, roughly, didn't He? But did He die for your sins? Yes, sir. Were you even born yet? No. Nope. Well, then how could He die for you before you were even born? You never mm -hmm. proved any guilt. You weren't born yet. Well, that God already <laughs> declared you guilty by His law. God proved that no flesh can be justified by the law. And we're flesh, aren't we? Yeah. So we were found guilty before we were ever born. Thank God... Jesus Christ died for us before any of us in this room was ever born. He died, didn't He? Okay. When Jesus Christ died, did He take upon Him our guilt? Well, how was that legal? Because the law found us all guilty. Christ died for all of us. God not only imputed or, or credited our sins to the account of Jesus Christ, He also credited our guilt. Now, what, who in the world can get rid of guilt? It's impossible. Folks, you can't. It's impossible on this earth to get rid of guilt. All right? Now, you could be wrongly accused, but you ain't guilty. So you, that's just a wrong accusation. Okay, how about a guilty man gets pardoned? They pardon him. He's in the electric chair, and at the last hour, the governor calls and they stop, right? Is that man's guilt gone? No. He's still, <clears throat> still guilty. Everywhere he goes, people will say, hey, there's that guilty guy that got out of going to the chair, right? All right, what about if a man's guilty and he goes to jail and serves his sentence? Still guilty. Still guilty when he gets out. How about if a man's guilty and gets away with it? He's still guilty. Y'all he, know there's people walking around right now. We'd see him, we'd say, yeah, I know he did it. Yeah. Well, Sully raises his hand. But hey, what I want to show y'all is that God put our guilt to the account of Jesus Christ. So what we've basically got to understand is the reason that we're called the bride of of Christ is because when a sinner will acknowledge what they are in Adam, I am a doomed, damned sinner. And that's where I, I'm going to go to hell if I don't get saved. And that's where I deserve to be. Because I'm not, not just born in sin, but I've chose to sin. I spent all my life in rebellion. So now, if I'll just acknowledge what I am, 
then I can begin to see what Christ did for me. You know, Jesus said, they that are whole or healthy need no physician. Well, who goes to the doctor? Sick people. Who is the Bible? Who does the Bible consider the great physician? Christ. Who goes to Christ to get healed? People that know they're sick. Well, are we all sick with sin? Yes. If you right now will just acknowledge, and you ain't got to go anywhere, walk, ain't nobody going to give no invitation, you ain't got to go, there's no such thing in the Bible. You've got to acknowledge between you and God what you are and what you need. We need a Savior, don't we? And when we do that, in the blink of an eye, we are in God's mind translated out of this, I'm going to put this, this is a kingdom down here, out of this kingdom of this world, it's also considered the kingdom of the devil. And we are translated out of there into the kingdom of God, aren't we? But you can't get into the kingdom of God without being changed. And I'm going to change colors to blue here because that's exactly what God does. He changes us. Now, it doesn't mean this change that, oh yeah, I used to be a sinner, now I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that at all. It means I used to be in Adam's family. And what happened when I got saved? Now I've been put into Christ's family. How did I get into Christ's family? By being joined unto Him. That's why it's called a marriage. He, I use the example. I always use this, and I know y'all get sick of hearing it, but I had a friend that was... Um, he, she, we worked out at the same time at the gym, and you kind of get to be friends with everybody that's because y'all are there at the same time. And We would go uh, eat a lot. We were sitting in Zia's one night, and um, man, she was just just this beautiful girl. And I mean, everywhere she went, everybody stared at her. And she told me sitting in Zia's, she said, I'm going to be a millionaire. And I started laughing because she worked at Sawyer Furniture. I said, now how are you going to get to be a millionaire working at Sawyer's Furniture? She said, no, I, I can't do it working there. See, she had been trying to work her way there and had failed. She had finally come to the, I'm never going to get there this way, right? So she said, I'm never going to get what I want by my works. She said, but... I'm going to marry a millionaire. And I looked at her and I thought, yeah, that, that probably could happen. Y'all know what happened with her? About, about two years later, I guess, she married a millionaire. Overnight, what happened to her? You know, today they have prenups. There were no such thing years ago, right? <laughs> but in the blink of an eye, she, she located the person that had what she wanted, she didn't have, and she got joined unto him. You know, when two people get married, they become one, don't they? The Bible shows that it's like a new creation. You know, you could have uh, Mrs. So-and-so. It never before had that person existed, right? I got Maddie. Maddie, what's your maiden name? Moore. Moore? Okay. Maddie Moore. That's her. There she sits. But is that her? No. Y'all know who that is? That ain't even Maddie. That's Mrs. Al Asher. Isn't it? Had, had that, is that something new? Nope. The two become... No, I don't say two. <laughs> the two become one, right? And so then what happens when you get married? In, in old times, forget about prenups. Does the lady get a new name? Yes. Does the lady get a new residence? Yes. Does she get a new inheritance? Yes. She gets new family? She gets new everything, doesn't she? If you'll just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what's put to your account. You're joined unto Him, and therefore you go into the family of God, not because of anything you've ever done, because of who you're joined to. Okay, so that, that's how simple this is. Now, these letters that are written are written to the church, the bride of Christ. And yet the letters are written to local churches. And what did Jesus Christ say the church was going to look like from the first coming to the second coming? Was it going to be pure and unmixed? He said, look, here's what it's going to be like. The visible church is going to be full of all kind of bad things. He said it's going to be the true and the false right there together, isn't it? It's going to be goats and sheep, wheat and tares. And so basically what we've got in these letters is we've got uh, pictures of the church and her condition, pictures of believers. And in this one right here, remember the first one was Ephesus had left their first love. He, I use the example of the seven-year itch. You know, the, the so-called seven-year itch, the movie said at seven years a man starts to look around. He's kind of gotten tired of his wife. Well, in the picture of Ephesus, you had a picture of a church who started out with, with a burning zeal to serve the Lord, and now they're starting to kind of look around at the world. They're leaving their first love. 
Now that's a church doing it. But folks, you've had the church as a whole in the world doing it. You've had one church somewhere doing it for a while. You've had believers that have done it. Right now, we probably got all seven of these right sitting here amongst us, don't we? Yes. Don't we all know what it means at certain times to just kind of lose that burning passion and kind of turn away from the Lord? Yeah. We all kind of get spiritual depression because, look, Christianity is a long, long life, isn't it? Yeah. So that's Ephesus. The next one was the persecuted church. Persecuted for what they believe. Now, in our country, we've never physically had that. Uh, we've sure had it other ways, haven't we? But what about other places in the world? Yeah. Folks, there's Christians getting killed right now this morning just because wow. they're Christians. We don't even hear about it in our country. Right. If it was somebody dying for anything else, it would be all over the news. But because it's a Christian, it won't be on there. All right now, the third one we get to is Pergamos. And the Pergamos church, whereas the first one was that which was falling away, this Pergamos church is the over-tolerant church. That's kind of what I kind of called it. They're over-tolerant. Now, <clears throat> immediately somebody would say, well, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to be tolerant? Yes and no. We're supposed to be tolerant, but we're supposed to be intolerant about other things. Now, I'll show you what I mean. All right? First off, Pergamos, the city of Pergamos. It's located in what we would call uh, uh, eastern, no, western Turkey today. Okay? That's where it's at. And it, it, was the ha it was the capital of the Roman Empire in Asia. It was the head city. It's where the judgment seat sat. So it was a big, big powerful place. But in this place, they had this cult. And I can't say this. Any of y'all know Greek mythology? No? Osculite, Lapius, Oscul... I can't say it. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a, it's a Greek god who's the god of healing and medicine. Okay? He, he's, y'all know, you've ever, we've seen the surgeon's thing or the doctor's thing with the snake on the pole? Yeah. It, it, it came from here, and no doubt they, they got it through the idea of what Moses did. But it, it's, he's the god of healing. I'll tell you what, I'm going to write it up here, and y'all can look it up and learn how to spell it yourself. <laughs> it's Osculopius. Osculopius? Osculopius. Anyway. All right. Well, this is the God they worshipped in this town and in, in this area. And He's the God of healing. Supposedly it's Zeus' son by some woman and there's all kind of stuff with it. But He's the God of healing. He's the God of medicine. And He and His daughters are believed to have the power of resurrection. Okay? That's what they believed about this thing. Now, He presented, uh, or he represented medicine and all the arts of healing. And again, the staff with the snake on it. Y'all know we've heard about the Hippocratic Oath? do no harm and all that. When they first started taking it, the first part of it, they swore in the name of Oshku or whoever. That's how they started the oath. So that's what they worshipped in this town. It was, it was symbolized by, this, by snakes. And it's, if y'all ever heard of Pithona, it's where we get the word python from. They had a temple and all this stuff going on here. That's why it says it's where Satan's seat was. This is where they worshipped this stuff. Now who's the serpent the symbol of in the Bible? The devil. So it, what he's basically saying to this church is, look, you're located right in the center of some horrible stuff. Now you say all churches are, yes, but in this case they're located in the center of something really bad. Now, what about us? Folks, we're in this world, aren't we? You know, there were times when you could say this world wasn't as bad as it is today. I don't mean that there wasn't a sin, this world system. Are, are we living in a system that is right now uh, quickly being geared against anybody that believes in the Bible. Yeah. It is. that They're going to make the Bible hate speech. And they do it with, you know, pushing, say, well, y'all hate gays, or you hate this, or you hate that. No, I don't hate anybody. The, the point is they're saying the Bible is hate speech. And y'all know how all that goes. But anyway, in this town they lived in, let's say, imagine that you were a Bible-believing Christian and you moved to Vatican City, right? Oh. Now, how would your life be in Vatican City as a Bible-believing Christian? You're going to have a rough life, aren't you? Number one, you're going to get a job? Folks, you check that mark. They're going to have that box on there, you know. And you check that box. You ain't going to get a job in that city, are you? Are you going to have many friends? Are you going to get persecuted? It's going to be rough. Well, that's the kind of thing this church was. The church in Pergamos was sitting right in the center of this, this pagan worship. And all the towns had different things, but this is where they are. Now, 
when he says, uh, when I say this church is characterized by neglecting discipline, we need to talk about what is discipline. Um, are we supposed to be judging each other's sins? Judge our soul. You judge your own self. Folks, we ain't, I don't have time to judge any of y'all. I got all my own problems, right? But people say, yeah, but the church is supposed to judge. Yeah, we're supposed to judge what we present as a group, aren't we? In other words, let's say, um, all right, uh, Sully's an Irishman, so I use Sully. Me and Sully understand. Let's say Sully shows up drunk this week. Next week he shows up drunker. The next week he shows up. With Sully's drinking during the week, that's his business. But when he comes here and he's drunk and throwing up everywhere at Bible study, what will we say to him? It's your business. Sully, uh-uh. You, you know, look, you need to go, on, go home and go get sober and get yourself cleaned up and think about what you want to do. If we said, well, that's okay, let him do it, what would my neighbor across the street say? Well, you see there, Christian, see them, see what they're doing? And, and it's just, it's an idea for someone to, to throw rocks at, at the church is all it really amounts to. Now, in the case of the church at Pergamos, I just want y'all to go back and look at verse 12. To the angel or the messenger of the church at Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now, what is this sharp sword in the Bible? It's the Word of God. So what's he basically saying to this church? He says right away, I know thy works, doesn't he? In every letter, he says, I know thy works. Then what's the thing Christ has his eye on? The works of the church. Why? He said, you know a tree by its fruit, don't you? In other words, when the church is this mixture, well, let me just put it up here like this. We'll draw a square and we'll call this the visible church. Okay? Now, always in Scripture... There is a visible church, isn't there? For instance, if I come back to the Garden of Eden, there was a visible church right there in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? There were two men, both claimed to worship God, Cain and Abel, right? What was the difference between Cain and Abel? One really believed in God, one didn't. Now, Abel or Cain might have believed in God, but did Cain believe what God told Cain about Cain? Cain didn't believe that his works were unacceptable. He believed that he could work his way into satisfying God. And he proved that with his sacrifice, didn't he? What did Abel do? Abel trusted the blood sacrifice. So the difference was not in their sins. The difference is in what they believed, didn't it? Now... Abel was a true believer and Cain was a false believer. And there they were, both of them, there offering their sacrifices together. And that's a picture. In the church, you've got the visible church. And yet, in the visible church, you've actually got the true church. And look, don't think I mean this is some denomination or something. I don't mean that. It, God's people are everywhere, aren't they? But is everybody you see organized as worshiping Christ really worshiping Christ? But amongst those worshipers, what do you have? You've got the true. It's, it's called a remnant in the Bible. And you have them there, right? Now, what we're going to see in this letter of Pergamos is this. That the true church is, is, is not um, monitoring what's going on with this other group. In other words, there's those among them that are still going to the pagan temple and worshiping the serpent. And in those pagan customs in Greece, y'all remember what else went with it? They had the idols and they had the prostitutes all mixed with it and worshiping fertility and it was all just a big, it was a big drunken feast and, and whatnot what they were doing. So basically when he writes to Pergamos, he says, I know thy works. Now how do you determine the difference between the true and the false by what they say? No, the Lord says you watch the works. Okay, you watch the works. Now does that mean that we go around and I'm expecting your fruit? Well, I'm going to keep an eye on Bobby. I mean, I heard him. That ain't the idea at all, is it? it? The idea is just in general, what do we do? We look and see what is this, this that we're producing. That neighbor needs to see something good coming out of here. Yeah. And you know, there's a little church down the street. They got a sign. You know, they always put those signs up with something kind of to try to catch people's attention or whatever. And usually they're just kind of corny. But I saw one that's uh, been up for about a month now, and it's very true. It says, be careful. You may be the only Bible some people ever read. Oh, There's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. People don't read the Bible today. Folks, they say, I don't have time. But what are they all doing? You say you're a Christian. They watch you, don't they? 
they'll watch you like a hawk. Make a mistake, what do they say? Oh, ah, ha, see, yeah, just yeah. like me. Just you could ask them me. Better about their own sense. Huh? It just makes them feel better about their own sins. That's all it is. It's human nature. Y'all know misery loves company. Mm -hmm. hey, what it really boils down to is it, it's 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 not their fault, folks. It's our fault. Let me show you what I mean. Do you always have people professing to believe Christ? Mm -hmm. And yet, do they really believe? No. So they say they're Christians, and then what do they do? They just live like just horrible. And so what are they're false Christians, but when you say Christian, what's the world mostly see? Damn. False Christians. So then what do they say? Hypocrites, yeah. hateful, this a and y'all know there's a church up somewhere in New England that has done more harm in the name of Jesus Christ. I, I have no idea what they believe. It's something or another Baptist church, and I know this. They're constantly picketing a gay wedding. They're constantly showing up at abortion clinics and Y'all know what I'm talking about? That, that Westminster, something I think they're called? They're constantly going somewhere as a group to make fools of themselves. Are we called to do that in the no. Scripture? Nowhere. What are we called to do? Preach the Gospel. Preach the Gospel. Okay? Now, because of these tares among the wheat, he's telling the church at Pergamos, you need to get the tares out of there. Now, it's not that we're going to go around and say, oh, I'm watching you and all this. But when something is commonly reported, is it a problem? Now flip over to 1 Corinthians 5. I'll kind of show you what I mean. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1. You know, those that, that watch us and when we do this, and they understand the, the battle. Struggle that we have. No. But when we do fall, you know, we yep. don't understand that. Hey, you know, the, Lonnie, it's understandable, though, and I used to think the same way, and I, hey, I can have compassion on how they're thinking because when people present themselves as holier than thou, mm -hmm. number one, you feel like they're condemning and looking down your nose, so then when you see them do something, you do feel like, well, look at you, don't you? It's natural. Well, who told a Christian never present himself as holier than thou? Who, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who would y'all say was the most prominent Christian worker that ever lived? Paul. Paul. Oh, Apostle Paul, right? He even said that he, he labored more than all the apostles, didn't he? All right? Over the course of Paul's life, we've got a great example. The more Paul learned about the Lord and the more he worshipped over the course of his life, the more he learned about God, did Paul begin to say, boy, I'm getting more and more like him every day? Look at me. No. What was happening? He said he was getting worse and worse in his own mind. He, he was, Paul was beginning to look at things. He was beginning to really see sin for what it is, isn't it? It's amazing if you read what he wrote and read it across, how it progresses. He starts out and he says, look, I'm the least of the apostles. Well, that's one out of 13. That's pretty good, isn't it? I'd like to be number 13 out of the world, wouldn't y'all? That 13 would be great. That's what he said. I'm, I'm the least of the apostles. Well, you're still real eminent. A few years later and more experiences, people getting saved everywhere now. He's earning fruit, but you know what he says? He said, I'm the least of all saints. Yeah. I mean, that's he's going downhill, isn't he? And then at the end of his life, one of the, la the, last, no, one of the last letters he wrote, you know what he said? Chief. I am the chief of sinners. Yeah. You see what's happening to him? He, that man isn't growing in his estimation of himself. He's falling in his estimation of self. Why? He's seeing Christ for what he is, which makes you see you for what you are. He always used my t-shirts. I wash you, you know, white t-shirt you wear around doing junk, cut grass, whatever. Get them out. They're bleached. You get them out. They look great. Years ago, one time, I got them out and set them up there, and they all looking fine, and I had a new white dress shirt that I did with them. I got it out and set it up there like that, and I looked, and I thought, what in the world? All of a sudden, my t-shirts weren't white anymore. They were yellow. I mean, they were gross. You'd be like, you know, but I didn't know it. What did I have to have? I had to have a comparison. When I had something that was really snow white sitting there, I could see it for what it really was. Okay. Do we have a, a manifestation of God's righteousness? Christ is the righteousness of God. 
Okay? What's righteousness mean? Perfect. Yeah, perfect perfection. White. Snow white. <laughs> okay. What do we have to have as sinners to go into God's presence? We've got to be as righteous as Christ. Can you do it? No. It's impossible. Well, let's say there's something you've got to have to get into. You've got to have this to get into God's presence. Can I work to, perf to, to, to build it? You know, Isaiah said, if I take all the good works I've ever done and sew them into a garment, you know what they'll look like? Filthy, filthy rags. rags. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go to your wedding in a filthy rag? Mm -hmm. Okay? So I can't work to produce this righteousness, and that's what God expects for me to get in, right? Mm -hmm. I can't work to get it. I can't steal it. Can I steal it from somewhere? Mm -hmm. A lot of people try. You know, he said the kingdom is going to be with a bunch of people forcing their way into it, isn't it? And yet on the judgment day, we've got to pass through the door one at a time, and what happens if you don't have on that pure white wedding garment? Christ says, depart, I never knew you. You can't get in without it. Well, wait, I can't work to get it, and I can't steal it. What's the only other way I could possibly get it? Somebody's got to give me a gift of it. And what does Christ say He'll put to your account the moment you believe on Him? His righteousness to your account. Literally, remember the prodigal son came home? He had seen what he was. He'd come home, he said, he's practicing. Boy, I mean, I am just horrible. I'm not even fit to be called my father's son. I'm going to go back and just beg him to let me be a slave. Just let me do anything. Let me cut the grass, anything around there. It's better than what I am. And he's work, walking back, working out his speech. I've sinned against you in heaven, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just let me be your slave. And he looks up, and his dad's met him halfway. And he said, I have sinned against you in heaven, Father. I'm not worthy to be called thy son. And before he can say any more to dad, shuts him up, stops him. He don't want to hear his plan. He don't need to hear his plan. He had his own plan. He said, now, that's exactly right, son. Come on into the house. And he brings him right on in, and he puts the best robe on him and puts a signet ring on his finger. He gives him power of attorney. That's what it amounts to. Well, what did the older brother say? How dare him? I've never offended my father. I've done this, and I've never sinned against my father. You see the difference between the two? One of them's telling you what a great worker, how perfect he is. The other one's got out there and learned what he is. He's nothing. Which one of them's calling on the Father to accept him? The nothing one. And that's exactly what this life is about, folks. God put us on this earth so that we can see what we are. You got to don't compare yourself to the guy next to you. And me and Bobby are going to stand here and see who's got the nicest this or that. No, it won't work. I don't need to compare with Bobby or Bobby with me. If I want to see how righteous I am, I don't say, well, I know I'm a sinner, but... People say that to me all the time. It just it's horrible. Now, what's going to come after that statement? I'm not as bad as you. I'm not as bad as so-and-so, or I've never done this, or I always go here, I do it. They're going to tell me some merit they have that makes them better than another person, right? Who are they comparing themselves with? Other dirty rags. Well, yeah, I got a okay. I can go get a dirty shirt and compare it with the one I uh, was was sawing or sanding in all day yesterday. Well, the dirty one looks, you know, don't. But yeah, ain't what you got to compare it to. God said, if you want to go to heaven, stand next to Christ. Do you look exactly like Him and His righteousness? You can come in. Well, do we? No. Not unless we trust Him. When you call on Him as your Savior, you're joined unto Him, and guess what? When the husband goes into the feast, you go with him, don't you? You're one, one unit. Alright, so now, with the church in Pergamos, they've got a problem with their discipline. And the reason they've got the problem is, again, because what the church is going to be from the first coming to the second coming. It's going to be an admixture. An admixture of true believers and those that just profess to believe. And it's always been this way. Israel was an admixture. It's always that way. So now in 1 Corinthians 5, we've got an example here. Verse 1. Paul tells the church at Corinth, It is reported commonly. Now that's the key to the whole thing. How do we say reported commonly today? Everybody knows. It's well known, right? The whole time. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now consider this. These are a bunch of pagans, and Paul says, 
y'all got something going on there that even the pagans don't would frown upon. You got a man fooling around with his father's wife. Now there will be some that say, well, that's incest and that's why it's bad. It doesn't matter whether it's his mom or his stepmom. That's not the issue. The issue is, does everybody know this is going on? And what are the people in the town saying? That's some Christians. He, a, a, a fellow told me one time, he, he asked me if I was a Christian. And I said, yeah. He said, you believe in four gods. And I said, what? Four gods? What are you talking about? He said, you do? You're a Christian? I said, yep, four gods. I said, who? He said, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Mary. <laughs> now, you know, in that man's estimation, he meant that. He was being honest. Well, what's the only experience he'd had with somebody calling themselves a Christian? A Catholic. So he thought that's what Christianity was. Well, what would the people in Corinth say when someone said Jesus Christ? No thanks, I don't want to sleep with my mom. Think that would be the attitude? Now, it, this is not just a situation where, okay, if this is just uh, somebody's doing something immoral, right? If everybody knows about it is the issue. If everybody doesn't know about it, then it's not an issue publicly for the church to deal with amongst themselves. It's an issue for them to deal with with God. Let's do it this way. Are we going to hire a private investigator? Do you all know what I was doing last night? Well, how do you know you can have fellowship with me? I just thought about it. Sometimes you'd have to hire one to find out some other work. Yeah. I mean, seriously, what are we going to do? Am I going to get, get somebody to follow Bobby and Maddie and Al? I, we'll find out. Then we'll meet and I'll let you all know what we come up with. Folks, that ain't the issue. The issue is it's commonly reported. I'm not making light of sin, but we're sinners, aren't we? Nobody's saying sin is okay. We're supposed to be... Uh, uh, growing in Christ. But with this group, he says this is going on, and watch their reaction to it, verse 2. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. What's their attitude about this thing? Well, we're, look how forward thinking we are. We're liberal minded. Man, we're a modern church, you know. We, we're okay. He, you, you, uh, I, I don't even know how to go about saying how to. Okay. When something is commonly reported, we once had some folks come in here and uh, they brought a, a, a man they know and this man was having an affair with this lady and was carrying on with this lady and the other lady told everybody about it. Talked about it non-stop. Remember Lexi? And, and I, I tried to talk to her one time but I go, look, number one, this is his business, you know, but she just kept going on. So finally I had to tell him, you can't, I'm sorry, but you can't come anymore. You can't be doing that and income, you see, and I'm not judging a man. It's that it's commonly reported. That's the problem. Anything that's commonly reported that is of this nature, you've got to try and, Barney Fife said, nip it in the bud. Now, are you doing the person any uh, favors by just overlooking them? If they're a Christian, are they going to pay dearly at the judgment seat of Christ? You know, I always use Simon Cowell's story. You remember when American Idol first come out, they had a girl in there who couldn't sing to save her life. And her family's telling her, you're the greatest. Her mom and grandma, oh, you're wonderful. She went out there and sang. I can't sing, but I know she couldn't either. It was bad. Paula Abdul wouldn't even deal with it. She said, I love your dress. Where'd you get your dress? And I thought, well, okay. It moved over to Randy, who's a, he's a little tougher, but he's nice too. He said, it was a, that was a little pitchy in a couple places. So she thought, well, I'm real good, but I made a couple slips. Simon went last. They always put him last for a reason. She looks, she looks at Simon. He said, young lady, is there a McDonald's in your hometown? Yeah. She said, yes. He said, just as soon as you get home, go to McDonald's and get a job application. You're no singer. Yeah. Now, which one of them actually did her, told her the Simon. truth? You know, I bet her family told her he don't know what he's talking about. He's, come on, somewhere that girl is still living at home. Still trying to be a singer, I bet. Don't you think it would have been better for her to go ahead and deal with that then? Sure. Get it out of her system? Well, watch what he says about this man. Verse 3. For ver I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. He said, I've already made up my mind. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan, now, does that mean curse him to hell? No. Folks, we don't have that power, and who'd want to do that? If you really want to see somebody go to hell, something's wrong, okay? He says, deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, 
that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, when he says, deliver him unto Satan, where was this person at? He's, he's sitting there in the kingdom of God, visibly in him. What did he say? Turn him back out to the world. Now, what's going to happen to that man when they turn him out to the world? If he's not really saved, he's going to say, you bunch of this, that, that, and he's going to go out and talk about it to the day he dies. Point fingers at him, isn't he? But if, and he tried, but if he is really <coughs> saved, what's he going to do on the outside? Folks, it's going to break his heart. He's going to bring him to look at himself and see to where he will go back. You know, when Paul writes the second letter, what he tells him? He said, okay, now enough's enough. This man straighten that out. Bring him back in. Don't judge him. Love him like a brother. You see, that's, that's the kind of the thing about church discipline. And when you talk about these things, I mean, look, this can be a real touchy subject. I've only ever had to do this twice that I can know of. Uh, yeah, really twice. And be honest with you, both times I really didn't handle it properly because I should have handled it earlier. But you never want to make a mistake in that regard. You know what I mean? And so I just kept praying and waiting, praying and waiting, and the Lord handled it Himself. Now I thank Him for handling it, and I hope it works out a good outcome, but ultimately I'll probably stand at the judgment seat and hear Him say, you should have handled that earlier. And you didn't, but He took care of it. He, God does all these things in His time. He will take care of it. But when it comes back to this church at Pergamos, remember what the problem is. It's where they live and the, the world they live in. Notice what He says. Flip back over to uh, Revelation 2. I find a lot of comfort in this in, in both ways. In Revelation 2, verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. Does the Lord take into consideration the world we live in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a world today, temptation has never been, in my opinion, sin's always been the same and distraction, all that. But as far as the temptation of the world system, you know, the Bible teaches we're really tempted three ways. Flesh, the world, and the devil. Flesh never has changed. The devil never has changed. But this world, has there ever been a, a more um, uh, accessible uh, world? Is there anything you can't have? I always use the dollar store as an example. Folks, the worst thing in the world is when they build a dollar store across the street from your house. We got one... Y'all go right down there, right? What is, what do they have at the dollar store? They want the Oreos are there, ice cream, uh, Skittles. Uh, we could keep going on with this one over here. Could we? <laughs> but you know what happens? You, I won't even be thinking about it. And I heard yesterday, I was outside working on something for Chris yesterday, and all of a sudden somebody said, we ought to have a fire. Look at these sticks I found and picking up sticks in the yard for me. Ain't that nice? That was very nice. I've seen right through that. <laughs> Y'all know why we ought to have a fire? <laughs> Marshmallow s'mores. <laughs> and you know, I thought, I said, well, no, you just ate. You don't need no s'mores. But you know what she did? She put it in there. Yeah. And I started thinking, man, <laughs> marshmallow and chocolate. I'm not saying there's something. Look, I'm not saying that that's simple. What I'm saying is it's right there right. at my fingertips. Is there anything Amazon Prime could have it at my door tomorrow? Yep. It can be here, can it? Mm -hmm. How about as far as information? Right there right on that computer. That oh, right there. He, I'll, just to show y'all how this works, how, how technology and whatnot. Do y'all know what drove the movie industry as far as making it accessible to individuals? Not going to the movies, but remember it used to be in 8mm films? Mm -hmm. They sold tons of them. Y'all know what was driving that? Pornography. All right. Do y'all know what drove the VHS industry? Mm -hmm. Pornography. Do y'all know what drove the internet? Pornography. It's the same thing. In other words, that's just, and that's just one one version. It's just showing you. It's right there, isn't it? Okay. So we live in a world like that. And the Lord says, "I know where thou dwellest. Where do they dwell? Even where Satan's seed is." And the word "seed" is the same word translated "throne." Now. Who does the Bible say is the God, little g, of this world? Okay. What does it mean by world, by the way? This system. It, the word world means the order of things. It doesn't mean the earth. Folks, Satan does not own the earth. 
But who is the one behind man as he's organized? The devil. He's always been that way. Okay? Now, who and, and where does the church, amongst whom do we dwell and where is the church at today? It's in this world. Now, Jesus said to the apostles the night before he died, he said, you're in this world, but you're not of this world. So we've been translated, if you're saved, you've been translated your citizenship out of this world into the kingdom of God. But where do you live at? In the world. In this world. Therefore, what did Paul call us while we're in this world? Ambassadors. Now what does an ambassador do? He represents his king with a message. Does an ambassador fight with a gun? An ambassador generally carries terms of a peace treaty, doesn't he? I mean, literally, ambassadors in the old days, an ambassador was sent before war breaks out to try and work out peace. Well, what's coming on the world over here? The wrath of God. For what? For sin and unbelief. So then, what's our message today? You ain't got to go. You don't have to, to do that. You've got the Lord Jesus Christ died for you. If you'll just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and call on Him in truth and sincerity, folks, He'll... he'll you, you'll be a, escape the wrath. You'll be able to get through. Uh, I don't say through. You'll be able to not partake of eternal fire and all these things. In other words, you don't have to stand in the judgment. You can stand at the reward seat. So when an ambassador goes out, an ambassador's message is important, isn't it? Can he change his message? Can he alter his message? If he does, he's not a proper ambassador. Where's his message come from? Straight from the king. Okay. What's the message that we carry today? It's the gospel. And the gospel, folks, is that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into this world and died for us. And that's the thing that can set a person free. If you believe that he died, he was buried, your sin was put out of the sight of God, and God raised him from the dead. That's the gospel, right? Now, an ambassador's message is the most important thing, isn't it? But there's one other thing that's real important. Well, he's going to have to believe his message or he ain't a real ambassador. Oh. Let me ask y'all, what kind of an ambassador, let's say you had a message to, um, uh, you know, a, I got a message to uh, Iran, right? Let's say, let's use Maddie. Maddie has a message to carry to Iran. If Maddie wants her message to be heard, what had Maddie better do? Talk. Well, you got to talk, but before you get off the plane, you better do something else. Put on, put on the you better get on that headdress and cover yourself up. Yeah. What are you going to go over there in blue jeans? No. What are you going to do? You're going to dress like they dress, or your message ain't going to be accepted. In other words, the the uh, the walk of the ambassador matters, doesn't it? So then if Maddie's going to go over there and be heard, she's going to have to make sure before she ever delivers her message, which is offensive, that she herself is not offensive, isn't she? Yeah. Now why is the gospel of itself offensive? What's the first thing the gospel tells a person? You're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner heading to hell. And y'all know it does offend. Because when you tell someone that, they'll cut you off and say, you think you're better than me. Nope. I'm exactly like you. The only difference is I'm no longer heading to hell. But then you do think you're better than me. No, I just heard something before you did. That's all. So the ambassador's got to make sure that he or her himself's not an offense, right? Now, what would the message in Corinth, would the preaching of the gospel in Corinth be easier because of what was going on in the church or harder? harder. And that's why the discipline mattered. And that's the church at Pergamos wouldn't do that. Now, why did the church at Pergamos not do that? We know they wouldn't do it because watch what he says in uh, verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, thou holdest fast my name. They have not denied the name of Christ. He says, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. And by the way, slain where Satan dwelleth, the, the, there was a man named Antipater, and, Antipater, and that's who they say, this is 
referring to. I don't know, but the way it's worded is he wasn't just slain in the city. He was slain before the throne. In other words, they carried him into the temple and offered him as a sacrifice, that sort of thing. Now, have these people stood up to physical persecution? Yes, they have. But guess what? Satan's got a more effective tool, doesn't he? What always is more effective than outward persecution? Inward. Inward corruption, right? So that's why he says next. But, even though you've stood up to the outward persecution, I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there, in other words, among the church, you have there them that hold, and by the way, that word hold is the exact same up in the, uh, verse 13, hold us fast. It's not, you've got some that believe this, you've got some that hold on to this and aren't letting it go. You, you've talked to them about it being wrong and they, 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 this is what they're going to do. They're hanging on to it, right? Now, hold the, they hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, what have I told you all is the key to understanding the book of Revelation, if there's a key, it's symbols, and where do you understand the symbols from? Old Testament. Folks, this is a bunch of Old Testament symbolism. Now, if you, we're going to take a break in a second and we'll look at Balaam. But Balaam was the key to understanding this. He says, you've got some there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, another king, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, that would be God's people, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. He, you know, let me put it this way. If you want to get along in the world, what do you do? You go along. To get along, you go along, right? When they persecuted them, they stood up fine for that. But would they stand up to the just general corruptions? And Satan always, that's how he works, isn't it? Folks, outwardly attacking God's people never works. All you do is run out the unbelievers and you really got a strong group, don't you? But when all these false believers come in and prosperity and good times, that's when the church gets in trouble. Because they bring in with them all that other junk and the world sees it and they, it's like they look and they say, well, hold on a minute. I can't tell the difference between the church and the world. Are you, you're who? You're saved? I've told y'all before about one time I hadn't been saved long and there I am sitting at a table in a Mexican restaurant with a friend drinking a margarita and the girl come up and said something. I started talking to her about the Lord and she looked at me and smiled and looked straight down at that frozen margarita. She just stared right at it. Y'all know it. She was right too. You know what she was telling me? I don't see no difference between you and the world. What's that? And basically she was letting me know what kind of hypocrite are you? Now, can a Christian drink a margarita? Yes. But are you going to be an effective witness if you do it? No. Not to her. You say, well, to somebody else. And people always say, yeah, but if you sit down and have a drink with them, then they'll see you're just like them. I guarantee you when you say that, all you're really wanting to do is justify what you want to do. Hey, I'm not uh, bashing anybody's drinking or anything, but let me say this. If you're going to preach the gospel, just don't fool with it. Just, just leave it alone. Okay? He, I know uh, me and Wayne joke. Wayne said, how good's a cold beer back there in your backyard down beside the fence after you yeah. cut the grass? <laughs> in other words, huddled up back yeah, there drinking a cold beer. Well, what he really means is, hey, my neighbor sees me, even though that beer ain't going to hurt him. But, I mean, Paul told Timothy, have wine for his stomach. It's not that. What it is, is will it harm Wayne's ability to share the gospel with his neighbor? Mm -hmm. Then the best thing to do is don't let your neighbor see it or don't do it. Okay? All right, let's take a break. <clears throat>